low physics 490. So in this video, we're going to be reviewing chapter 12, static equilibrium and elasticity. And in this chapter, we're going to be discussing the topics of rigid objects in equilibrium, the center of gravity, examples of rigid objects in static equilibrium, as well as elastic properties of solids. The term equilibrium implies that the object moves with both constant velocity and constant angular velocity. And the term elasticity deals with how objects deform under load situations and then return to its original shape when those deforming forces are removed. So in section 12.1, rigid objects in equilibrium, we are looking at a graphic where there is a force acting on a rigid object. And if we remember from chapter 11, we recall that the torque associated with the force of an axis, which in this case 0.0, is given as torque equals R cross F. And from chapter 10, the magnitude of torque is F times D, where D is the moment arm. And with that, we know that the net torque on a rigid object causes it to experience an angular acceleration. But since we're only considering rigid objects, we're only going to look at situations where the angular acceleration is zero, also known as rotational equilibrium. And since the sum of torque external is I times alpha, it's necessary for the rotational equilibrium that the net torque is also zero. With that being said, we have two necessary conditions for a rigid object in equilibrium. The first condition is a statement of translational equilibrium, which states that the net external force on the object must equal zero. Also, the forces in the x and y directions need to be balanced. Therefore, the net force in the x-plane must equal zero, and the net force in the y-plane must also equal zero. The second condition is a statement of rotational equilibrium, which states that the net external torque on the object must equal zero. Additionally, the net torque about the perpendicular axes, or the z-axis, must also equal zero. So moving on to 12.2, center of gravity of a rigid object. So when dealing with a rigid object, we must consider the gravitational force acting upon it. Previously, we learned about the center of gravity, which is a single gravitational force acting through a point which is equivalent to the combination of the various gravitational forces acting on all the various mass elements of the object. In this case, we're going to assume that gravity is uniform over the object. So looking at the equation below, we're able to determine the x-coordinate of the center of mass by solving for the sum of the masses multiplied by the sum of the x-components of those masses. Then we divide that value by the sum of masses of all the locations on the object. And to find the y-component, of center of mass, you just replace each x with its y counterpart. So now we're going to assume that the gravity is not uniform over the object. So by equating the torque resulting from total mass multiplied by the gravity at the location of the center of gravity to the sum of the torques acting on the individual particles gives us this first equation. And this expression accounts for the possibility of the value of g varying over the object. But if we assume uniform g over the object, which is usually the case, the g factors cancel each other out, which equates in, in an equation similar to the center of mass equation. Like before, to find the y component, you would replace each x with its y counterpart. And, you know, remembering the similarities between the center of mass and center of gravity equations, this shows us that the center of gravity is located at the center of mass as long as gravity is uniform over the object. Moving on to 12.3, which are examples of rigid objects in static equilibrium, uh, we must remember that for a system to be in equilibrium, the net external force must be zero and the net external torque must also be zero. And noted that the second condition can only be satisfied if the center of gravity of the system is directly over the support point. So looking at the graphic on the right, we have the wood center of mass and we have the bottle center of mass. 
in between those is the system center of mass, which is right above the support point. 12.4, elastic properties of solids. In previous chapters, we've explored deformable systems, but in reality, all objects are deformable to some extent, which means that it's possible to change the shape or the size of an object by applying external forces. We're gonna talk about deformation in terms of stress and strain, where stress is a quantity that is proportional to the force causing a deformation, and strain, which is a result of stress, and is a measure of the degree of deformation. Stress is proportional to strain, where the constant of proportionality depends on the material being deformed, as well as on the nature of the deformation. This proportionality constant is called the elastic modulus, which is a ratio of the stress to the resulting strain. And of course, there are many different types of deformation, but we're only going to be discussing three of them. So Young's modulus measures the resistance of a solid to a change in its length, which is also known as tension or tensile. Shear modulus uh, measures the resistance of motion uh, of the planes within a solid parallel to each other, also known as shearing. And bulk modulus measures the resistance of solids or liquids to changes in their volume. So that's it for our review of chapter 12, Static Equilibrium and Elasticity, where we discuss the topics of rigid objects in equilibrium, the center of gravity, examples of rigid objects in static equilibrium, as well as elastic properties of solids. I'd just like to thank you for tuning in to this week's physics talk. And if you liked this week's video, I'd appreciate it if you dropped a like and hit the subscribe button down below so you'll never miss one of my weekly talks. And if you're interested in some more content, I'm also posting weekly videos over my Patreon page. So head over there if you wanna get twice the amount of content that's over here on YouTube. And once again, I apologize for going so long, but uh, thank you for making it this far in the video, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all next week.